Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name's Kristen Alford. I'm the director of the Science Creativity Education Studio at UniSA, which is known as Psyched. Just hard to say, but Psyched. Um, together with Jeff Slack, I'll be your MC for this entrepreneurship forum, and I'd like to thank you all very much for attending today, uh, especially our um, very distinguished speakers who will be sharing a lot of amazing and wonderful information. We've had a couple of run-throughs for the week, and I'm really looking forward to hearing them, and I'm really disappointed that I won't be able to attend some of the parallel sessions myself. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the IPA professional and corporate members, the IPA councillors and the IPA partners, PwC, Warman's Lawyers and Flinders University. So given all of that, to start I'd like to introduce my friend Michael O'Brien. Um, Michael works in State Government in Families SA and as a Ghana man will welcome us to country. Please welcome Michael. Nina Mani. Mani Ai. Mani Ai. Ah, Muna rana wanga di mani na buni gani yatana imdi yata tantanya wama. No inari kumatpi maraja. Firstly, I'd like to welcome you to Ghana country. Secondly, I would like to welcome you to this place. This place was a place known for our ceremonies, where many Aboriginal people gathered from many nations, and we had a word for that called bamba bambaya which means conference. And today, you have a conference and a celebration. My name is Michael O'Brien. I'm a descendant of the Ghana people. My father is Yela Burka, the old man of the sea, known as Uncle Lewis O'Brien. My mother is a Naranga elder from the York Peninsula, and her name is Pauline O'Brien. Now, today I, um, I want to share some stories. Because when you walk this land, the land becomes a part of you and you become a part of it. Now, when we talk about innovators, there's a great man who was a great innovator. And he was known as the Da Vinci of Australia. Now, many of you may not know that man. He sits on your $50 note. Does anybody know what his name is? No? I have a $50 note here, and if you care to take one out, you'll see him. His name is David Yanipin, another jury man from down south. He um, was a pioneer. He had something like 10 patents, and some of those patents led to great innovations and great ideas, one of them being the shearing shears, because he took perpetual motion and turn it into a linear action to give us that cutting action. He also was a person who thought about the polarisation of light, which is now what we see in things like lasers. He also believed that taking two boomerangs and putting them together would enable us to have flight in an upward direction, a vertical direction, which is what we see now as in helicopters. And so he was a great innovator, a great pioneer, a man who was in some ways left school at the age of 13 and so was poorly educated. But he had great people around him. Now I want to tell you a story, a story where the modern man came to a great elder and he wanted to ask him about the future of the world because he saw that the world was changing and he understood and valued the fact that our people lived on this earth for 40,000 plus years and he wanted to find that wisdom. And so as he approached him, he talked about the fact that the, the world was getting hotter and the world was changing and he was unsure that where the world would be. And so he asked this elder that particular question. Now the elder sat there and he didn't respond. And again he asked him that question. Great elder, please tell me this is a, an important question. I need your help. And again the great elder sat there without a response. 
And so he looked at the great elder and he could see that he was doing something. And so he asked the elder, what are you doing? He said, I'm making something. He said, well, what are you making? He said, I'm making a cloak. He said, great elder, I've just explained to you that the world is getting hotter. It's changing. Why would you be making a cloak? That's not going to keep you cool in a hot weather. He said to him, I know what you're thinking. You would think that I would make something like a pair of bathers. Well, no, I'm making a cloak because what follows great heat is great cold. And if I make my cloak now, I have the materials, the resources to do that. Because when winter comes, I will not have those resources. So I am preparing for the future. And so he said to him, you make bathers, I'll make cloaks. And we'll see who is there in the end. Now that story tells us many things. It's not about always looking about today. It's looking about tomorrow. And thinking. It's not about reinventing things. It's about taking the knowledge and the wisdom that is there. And I believe as people, and particularly as an Aboriginal person, we have things that we can share, we can learn. We stand on a place that is, has the oldest living culture in the world. And yet sometimes we look past it. And I encourage you all to maybe think about looking into the culture and the wisdom that is at our doorstep. And maybe we can continue to learn, we can continue to share in those values so that when we go forward, we take those things with us. And so I want to finish off with a small ceremony with Kristen in demonstrating those elements of what our values and understanding of people is. And so I say these uh, words, Naranadlu, Kamanka, Yarakumanindi. I have here four colours, the colours of the Aboriginal flag being the black, the red and the yellow, and also additional colour being the white. The white to represent the non-Aboriginal people. And so I'm going to share in painting, not only Kristen, and Kristen will paint me, in joining that because we've just been through a week of reconciliation and I believe that should continue and not just be a week but forever. So I'll paint and she will paint me. The yellow being the giver of hope and the sun, the light, the red being the land, the white as I said being the non-Aboriginal people and the black being the representation of the Aboriginal people. And she will do the same to me. And so I say to you, Nacho Yukandayu, Nacho Yakandayu, Puni Adu Wadu, I say to you, truly, as brothers and sisters, let's walk together in harmony. Nay tell you and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that <coughs> that excellent welcome, and uh, it's certainly a hard act to follow. Um, my name is Jeff Slack. I work for the Department of Communities and Social Inclusion, and I'm here to just give you a bit of an overview of today. Uh, before I start, I just want to also acknowledge that this land we meet on is the land of the traditional land of the Ghana people, and that we respect their spiritual relationship to their country. And also, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for attending today. Uh, we've pulled together quite an action-packed agenda and hope you'll enjoy it and I'll take you through that. The reason I've been chosen to speak to you today is because I was one of a number of people uh, who are here today who are involved in organising this, this forum and this agenda. I was fortunate last year to be able to participate in the first of these forums in South Australia and what I learned from that event is that entrepreneurship um, a sort of a new term to me last year, is used to describe entrepreneurial activity within an organisation. And in this case, it's within the public sector. Such activities range from tactical 
tactical risk taking to inspire innovation. I think we picked up a bit of that in, in Michael's story before. What impressed me about the event last year was the clear evidence of a groundswell of innovative and entrepreneurial activity happening within SA government and with our partners. Over 150 people, like-minded people attended with a drive to respond to challenges in SA and identify opportunities to work together and try new things. This inspired me to become a part of the movement and I'll talk to you a little bit later about how you might too. I'd also like to say that these sorts of events are often seen as a nice to do event in a busy environment and it's really great that you've turned up. So on the agenda, and if you look at your program, you'll note that it's all there, so you can actually run through it with me. Uh, when we set up to set up the forum, we wanted to make sure we built on the success from last year. Some of these things are in response to feedback from last year, other things are new things. A lot of effort has gone into putting the agenda together, and we've got an impressive and distinguished group of speakers across the day. You'll also see that it, it caters to diverse needs, new people and people who are returning. Uh, and we'll also traverse a range of an entrepreneurial themes or entrepreneurial themes. So this session, session one, you'll be hearing next from Irma Ranieri, the Commissioner for Public Sector Employment, who will inspire you to innovate and be drivers of public sector reform. Then we'll hear from Professor David Aldrich, who's an expert on entrepreneurship, government policy, innovation, economic development, and global pet competitiveness. After morning tea, which is just outside, we'll split across two rooms. In the East Room, which is the room over there, we'll focus on some practical examples of entrepreneurship with six practitioners giving us some insight into the magic they use to give their ideas life. We'll be using also the Pecha Kucha style, which is a sort of a fast-paced sort of interactive style. In this room, we'll have an up-close session on linking theory to practice with presenters covering, considering how the research can support the implementation of the Working Together for Joined Up Policy 90-day project across South Australian Government. We'll then come back together in this room where Kristen will uh, wind up some of the themes. After lunch, we'll split across three rooms. In this room, we'll have a masterclass on organisational resilience led by Jason Gotch and Kath McEwen. In the Western Room, the one just next to us here, we'll use our soon-to-be-patented fishbowl method to examine two Splash Adelaide events and compare and contrast those two events. In the Premiership Suite, which is actually just the end, down the end of that corridor near all the football memorabilia, although that's pretty much this whole place, um, we have the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, or TAXI, who will drive another masterclass on creating the conditions for social innovation. So enough there to pick up on everyone. After this, we'll transmission back to this room where we'll hear from the second keynote, Fiona Kerr, who will use her knowledge of neuroscience to help us become better leaders. Then we'll wrap with a panel at the end of the day and look at some key themes where you'll be able to ask some further questions. So there's a lot in that, and I'm sure you'll find, each and every one of you will find something that interests you. Now, before I introduce Irma, a couple of brief plugs. This forum would not have happened if it weren't for the people joining the entrepreneurship community of practice across government. After you leave today, inspired to action, make sure you register an interest in joining the community. We want you to join our movement. Along with these events, the community of practice also hosts four entrepreneurship laboratories across the year, and we're also looking for other opportunities to spread the word. It's also easy. You'll get an, uh, an end of uh, forum uh, evaluation. You can register there. You'll also see some people like me wearing this ludicrously large Speak To Me badge. Um, we wear it not because we're desperately lonely, but because we're actually here to answer any and all of your questions. So if you want to ask more questions about the agenda, if you want to ask about what the topics that we've talked about, feel free to come up to either myself or anybody else. The only thing I'd say is please don't ask me how to get a 20-month-old sick baby to sleep at night, because last night I was not successful at that. So consider yourself up to speed on the agenda. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Irma Ranieri. Appointed on 1 July 2014 as the Commissioner for Public Sector Employment, Irma works passionately to ensure that the SA public sector is a trusted, respected, courageous and honest organisation. It is her legislative role to improve, improve public sector performance and her professional goal to create a world-leading public sector that serves South Australians well does what it says it will do, and to which every public servant is proud to belong. 
In 2014, Irma was named the 2014 Telstra Businesswoman of the Year, an essay winner of the Telstra Community and Government Award for her role in leading transformational challenge change throughout the public sector. She is, in summary, far more accomplished than me, and so I'm now going to get out of her way and let her speak. Welcome to Irma. Thank you so much, and uh, look, uh, I want to start by actually saying I absolutely love the public sector, um, and I think that people that know me would know that, and I want to kind of at first start by thanking everyone in the room, because I think you're only here because you're actually really passionate about it as well, um, and these sorts of events are actually critical. Um, my job is actually to talk about the value of people's ideas um, and to bring out some of the things that we've been doing across the public sector. Um, so I'm hoping that I can inspire you. Thank you for setting the, the, the standards so high. Let's start with something from Eleanor uh, Roosevelt saying, great minds discuss ideas, and I consider this whole room to have great minds. Ideas are intrinsic to our lives. They shape how we perceive ourselves and the world. The stories we tell to one another and the plans we make for the future. I'm a great believer in storytelling, and thank you, Michael O'Brien, for the story you told us today. I think that's how we grow and learn about each other. We value ideas by investing in them, and the public service is no different. There are 100,000 people in the South Australian public sector, and any time someone asks me, you know, do you think that's too high or too low, all I say is what we need to do is whoever is in the public service needs to feel really good about working in there. We work in every corner of the state, with every sector of the economy and with every, every strata of society. This is a mass of almost immeasurable activity in education, health, justice, industry development, workplace reform, well-being, planning, the arts, and so it goes on. In this complex and astonishingly dynamic environment, how many ideas are we generating in a single day, let alone a week, a month, or a year? I know I had about four just sitting there. And how do we, go, uh, how do we know a great idea when we hear it? Another quote. Albert Einstein once said that if at first an idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. So you have permission to get really uh, creative today. In other words, the best ideas challenge us. They turn the status quo upside down and force us to see our challenges in a different light. And that's what I love about the forums today. And my view is that when we do have those ideas, that's what we call change across the public sector, and a lot of you have been involved in that process. And more importantly, the way we react to that is actually really positive. We're all here because we want to find new ways to respond to the challenges that we see around us. We're passionate people, I know that. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. Our work is essential to the meaning of our lives, I know it is for me. People are diminished when they are silenced, and they are silenced when their ideas are not valued. Modern workplaces support ideas through the adoption of flexible work practices that I've lived myself, that allow for new communities of colleagues to form through the open flow of information and through the constant prioritisation of people's professional development. This is happening in the public sector, but of course we can actually do more and you all play a part in that. We're implementing a 1HR strategy across government. Why am I doing that? Because we need to streamline processes so we can use um, our, our energy and talents for other things. We need everyone in the public service to feel valued and know that they actually know what's expected of them and that they're developed as a public servant for across the sector. That's really important to me. There's some fundamental things that need to happen. We need to continue, and you know how passionate I am about advocating for greater diversity. One of the four foundations of the Code of Ethics is diversity, and we included it um, this time. That's important not because um, it's just a nice thing to do, but we actually have to represent the community that we serve, and with new ideas and diversity of ideas, innovation occurs, in particular in leadership jobs, and we'll continue to work on that. Reforming de democracy is a policy that operates on a proliferation of ideas, and you've heard about the reforming democracy in open state that we'll have um, in October. So open state is occurring in the last two weeks of October, if you like, it's a broad festival of ideas about how we can shape our future based on mutual regard, openness, transparency and democracy. It's going to be really exciting. Ten days of collaboration, innovation and engagement to help shape our future and explore how open and transparent decision making can create a better South Australia. 
The 10-day program will bring more than 10,000 people together, hopefully 100,000, which is the public service, with natural con uh, national conferences, the Adelaide Festival of Ideas, the Of the People Symposium, and a range of community events, workshops, and activities. The first week will kick off with conference events from IPA and IAP2, and IPA is actually partnering with um, the AIIA. These events feature expert speakers on the changing face of democracy, innovation and collaboration, and what it means for our future. Over the weekend, the doors of Adelaide will be open to ignite inspired conversations across the community, and I believe with pop-ups everywhere uh, along North Terrace. Open State's second week culminates in a range of workshops and activities, drawing from ideas developed from the first week, implementing them as plans for the future. Technology, data and future government will develop the conversation and encourage greater participation in the future of democracy. If you value ideas, yours and the ideas of others, put it into your calendar. In fact, you might have some over the next uh, few hours today that can actually be fed into uh, the organising of those conferences. So for reforming democracy is the latest aspect of the government's evolving reform program and many of you have been involved in that. The program in South Australia has been running um, since 2002 with the launch of the South Australian Strategic Plan. It predates events to that, the, the reforms of the Dunstan government and through multiple governments since. But the last decade and a half represent the most dynamic changes in the public sector for a generation. We've got to make some major shifts. As never before, the responsibility lies with you, the manager. Whatever your background or area of expertise, it's up to you to deliver. There are rules, but no manual. You're leaders, even if you're not leading people. The map is there to be drawn and redrawn according to the needs of your clients, and that means at your disposal. At, more than ever, it's at your discretion to give the best to the community that we serve. So your ideas and your ability to turn them into meaningful services and products will be your greatest asset. Every idea needs expression, and it's by coming together at events like this that we can find ways to bring these to, uh, ideas to fruition. I absolutely endorse the entrepreneurship group, and I congratulate the employees of the public sector who have shown the initiative and tenacity to bring it to fruition. It makes me feel really inspired and in particular for our young folk that have started in our Jobs for Youth program that are here on a table today. So here's some vital ways we can give life to our ideals. Know yourself, and I do that a lot in terms of my own leadership and being authentic about what I do. Search for your own values and see if they align with your work. We don't all have the luxury of dropping out to pursue our dreams and goals, but we can constantly test the grounds that shift our values and the values of our employers and clients. Are you where you need to be? And if not, how can we help you get there? Tell your story. Stories unite and galvanise us. We are natural storytellers. Ask any five-year-old about their day, but we won't ask Jeff about his child's night. We need to recapture our natural gift to storytellers. And we will focus a bit on storytelling uh, during the conference time. Opening up about our experiences and what drives us uh, gives your story, structure and meaning, and people understand you better. This is the golden age of communication. Do you have the courage to tell us who you are and what you've strived to achieve? And most important, the thing I put down to authentic leadership is telling people when you have failed and what you did to actually pick yourself up and move on to the next step. Listen to diversity. You're a link in a chain that extends across time and place. If you know yourself and you have the courage to tell your story, then find someone to share it with. We're a nation of, of over 23 million people on a planet of over 7 billion people, each with a story to tell. Do you have the courage to be and challenge by the diversity of this astonishing world? So finally, another quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald. No grand idea was ever born in a conference. Sorry, guys. Um, but coming together in these forums is essential. It's not simply what we conceive of today, but what we actually focus on and invest in tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irma. I'm, I'm really um, holding on to that ideas are essential to the purpose of life comment as somebody who's working in ideas um, and how we present ideas at Psyched. Um, what you said about the complexity of the system across different knowledge systems, I think we'll see a lot of that today. And we'll also see a lot of when things work and when things don't work. Um, which I think will be tremendously interesting to hear those different stories come through. 
Um, great minds, diverse minds give, give rise to ideas that challenge and transform and then give rise to the expression and outcomes. And I'm really looking forward now to introducing our next speaker, um, who I think will bring a, a great mind um, and also some great examples around ecosystems and that complexity that we are dealing with. So I'd like to introduce um, David Autrich, who's Distinguished Professor and Emeritech Chair of Economic Development at Indiana um, University, where he also serves as the Director of the Institute for Development Strategies. Um, and bringing a diverse range of experiences, not just from the US, but he's also Honorary Professor of Industrial Economics and Entrepreneurship um, at the WHU Otto Beisheim School of Management in Germany, and serves as Visiting Professor at the King Saud University in Saudi Arabia, as Honorary Professor at the Frederick Schiller University of Jena in Germany, and is a Research Fellow of the Centre for Economic Policy Research in London. So I just think that shows the, the breadth of experience that he's bringing. His research is focused on the links between entrepreneurship, government, policy, innovation, economic development and global competitiveness. Um, and he has honorary, honorary degrees from the University of Augsburg and from um, Joe Kaping University as well. So I now would like to welcome Professor Aldrich to present on entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship ecosystem strategies. Well, uh, thank you very much for that very, very kind um, introduction. Uh, Commissioner uh, Rentieri started off her talk by sharing how uh, passionate she is about being in the public sector. And um, I thought, yeah, uh, uh, what did they say in that famous movie, The Wizard of, of Oz? I'm not in Kansas anymore. Because uh, uh, in the United States, we had a president not too many years ago who would tell a joke, and the, the punchline was, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. Uh, he was also the same president who said, shared. The trouble with the French is they have no word for entrepreneur. I was in Montpellier, France a few weeks ago, and uh, I shared this with the, the colleagues there. And, uh, uh, and one of the colleagues said, well, no, our problem is we don't have enough entrepreneurs. Uh, maybe. But in, in any case, a, uh, 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 a, a different, uh, perhaps a future president, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, was no doubt right when she said, uh, it takes a village to raise a child. But when I first learned about or heard about entrepreneurship, nobody was talking about a village. The most celebrated case of entrepreneurship, albeit last century, was the famous case of the invention of the, um, the notepad. Oh yeah, the post-it sticker at 3M. I think that you younger people will be stunned to think, oh, this was a high-tech innovation, uh, uh, f well, from the last century. And 3M had uh, exactly what the commissioner described. Uh, there, were, there were people there. They came up with the idea, like a lot of ideas, it was inadvertent. They weren't looking for uh, a sticky pad or post or whatever they call it. They were looking for something else, but they kind of stumbled into it. And the brilliance of the, and this is in, in Harvard case studies and celebrated last century. Um, for sure, uh, is that the organization knew enough that they had, yeah, they had an idea and they knew that they had to uh, act on that idea and change a little bit to, to take advantage of that idea. And, uh, but in any case, uh, what I recall hearing about that idea in that entrepreneurship, it was all about the organization. It was nothing about, yes, there was a lot of important communication, a lot of understanding, uh, uh, by different colleagues that this was, a, this was an opportunity, uh, an entrepreneurial opportunity, well, an intrapreneurial opportunity, but an opportunity to generate a lot of positives. But it was kind of in isolation from the external community. And there was certainly a sense in that older thinking that I grew up with that said, yeah, I mean, innovation's all about uh, kind of uh, lifting yourself up by your, your bootstraps as an organization. And so we'd see the same thing with another entrepreneurial success by Nokia. I think it was just as recently as maybe a decade ago when uh, in a group like this, I remember all my students, all they had was Nokia. They called them handies in Europe, so we called them cell phones in, um, in, in the States. 
uh, and it was a great story. But again, Nokia, when, at least when I read accounts, when I've been to Helsinki to kind of hear accounts of how they accomplished this great entrepreneurship, it was all about the organizational success and nothing really about, uh, about a community. So then you've got an example of entrepreneurial failure, the iPhone. Of course, that's not entrepreneurial failure for Apple. It's entrepreneurial failure for Nokia because somehow, uh, I, asked, I asked my class actually um, a couple, couple weeks ago how many of the kids had, uh, had a Nokia. Um, and uh, there was actually one or two kids at uh, about 60 who had this phone. They were kind of embarrassed, but I won't, I won't <laughs> try to embarrass anybody here. But I mean, most of us have something like a smartphone now. And so the interesting question is, well, how is it, why is it that Nokia, that for all this great entrepreneurial success, kind of missed the boat? And then, you know, of course, one, one, uh, one man's success is another man's failure, I guess, or uh, I don't know if it's a zero sum. But we know that there is something different about the context that these two organizations uh, operate. I downloaded this. You don't really have to read the, the names. This is the, they call the family tree of where Silicon Valley actually comes from or came from, how it started. Up on the top, you see Bell Labs way back in the 1950s. Bell Labs wasn't in Silicon Valley. Bell Labs was in New Jersey. And there were people with ideas in Bell Labs, most notably uh, Gordon Teal and, and Shockley. They invented the transistor. A law prohibited uh, AT&T from developing the transistor, an antitrust law. So they had to leave the organization. They ended up out in California, uh, uh, started a, a new company, Fairchild. Uh, and then Fairchild had a lot of uh, inventions to start to develop the, uh, uh, the microprocessor, the, the chip. And here's what I think is always complicated when we say, well, let's embrace new ideas. Everybody likes new ideas. The problem was it was a small company, a startup like we hear about. It was an entrepreneurial company. And I think the trouble is, I mean, I'm all in favor of, of new ideas, too. Um, the problem is it's hard to tell what's a good idea from maybe an idea that's not so good. Because by the nature of an idea, you don't really know if it's good. So at Shockley, like a lot of uh, uh, organizations that are respecting ideas, different people had different ideas. And uh, pretty soon, um, uh, the company's hemorrhaging. Uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial startups. Some people call this the, the, the uh, fair children because all these spin-offs or startups are really coming out of, out of uh, Fairchild. Someplace in the bottom, or maybe it's even a layer below that I don't have here, comes, um, comes Intel, started by Gordon Moore. So there's a lot of successful, not successful companies. The point is, all this is before Apple. But Apple, of course, is working in this, you could call it ecosystem, environment, maybe Hillary Clinton would call it, this village where there's a lot of people with a lot of ideas. I, um, a, a scholar at the University of California, Berkeley, a sociologist named um, Annalie Saxinian, wrote a, 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 a well-known book about 15 years ago called Regional Advantage. And in this book, she compared two places. Um, Silicon Valley, and then Boston. And what she, uh, uh, what she, uh, uh, her question is, why is it that Silicon Valley keeps winning? Why do they do better in generating the thing that's so coveted? Not just the innovation, but they seem to generate the, the jobs, the standard of living, the opportunities. Uh, uh, where Boston, see, maybe it's like a great, since we're in a stadium, maybe it's like a great cricket match. The Aussies against, I don't know, New Zealand, and I guess it's Australia always wins, right? Every cricket match? Is that the way I understood it? I don't know. Um, but uh, in, in this match, uh, uh, she doesn't really prove it. In fact, she didn't really have to. We all kind of know whether you're measuring patents or whether you're measuring um, new product introductions. Uh, Silicon Valley seems to generate a better performance. She also doesn't really establish it. She asserts it. She says, look, they both have roughly the same resources that matter. They both have great universities. Palo Alto's got um, 
Stanford and the University of California and Berkeley and, and a number of other universities. Boston's got MIT and Harvard and so on. They both have great scientists, great engineers. Why is it that the performance, the innovative performance, but even more broadly, the ability to generate um, uh, creativity, creative products and so on, seems to always go to on the West Coast, not on the East Coast. And our answer went, uh, came down to one word, which was culture. Uh, there's a different, actually her answer was two words, it was or three words, Chuck's, Chuck's Wagon Wheel. Apparently there was a bar and grill um, in uh, Palo Alto where the, after work the software engineers would, they, and the, uh, the, the people working on the semiconductors, they'd congregate, they'd meet at events like this, maybe a little bit less formal and a little bit less organized. It wasn't a conference, I mean it was a bar. And they do what people do when they meet. They'd start to talk and they'd start to tell stories about their bosses and the people they work with and the ideas and the different, different things they're working on. And you get a lot of interaction, you get a lot of new ideas, and all this is kind of what fuels innovation. Now, that innovation isn't necessarily, I mean, in some ways, this is just one industry and one kind of snapshot, but all of us have a pretty good feeling, yeah, this is fueling uh, this kind of ecosystem that we, we call Silicon Valley. Meanwhile, in Boston, uh, uh, I was kind of, uh, I don't know if I was shocked or delighted to, to find uh, that you call this winter here. Uh, if you've ever been to Boston in the winter, it's, sure not, it's not like this, right? I mean, there's snow and, and it's cold and you have to wear a big coat. And so one thing for sure, after work, people, they don't go out and meet. They just go home and they hunker down by the fireplace and try to stay warm and so on. Uh, so there's a different culture, so Annalise Axinian portrays it. And it suggests that it's not just what the, and maybe this is the lesson for Nokia, uh, is that uh, being isolated, also in a cold climate, but I don't think that's really the point, but being isolated uh, and not in, um, not in a kind of ecosystem where you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, not just ideas, but a lot of people acting on those ideas, a lot of entrepreneurs, and it raises the complicated thing. I think a lot of us think of maybe intellectually or the way the fields have developed that, that um, entrepreneurship is the, or intrapreneurship is the opposite of entrepreneurship. But in some ways, this makes me think, ah, they're not, are they really substitutes? Are they really opposites? Are they really kind of uh, helpful? Because it was clear that the entrepreneurship that's been going on in Silicon Valley also helped to fuel the entrepreneurship in this one in this one example. Now I saw uh, this closer to home lily. There's a lily I found out in Australia when I looked up to try to get the, get the, the logo. I came up with lily Australia. The lily I know is the, the, the proud headquarters we have in Indianapolis about an hour away from me up the road. I live in a small town, Bloomington. Lily's headquarters is up in Indianapolis. And when I moved to Bloomington about, um, about 20 years ago, Lily was having this dilemma. Um, I talked to people, read a little bit about it in the newspapers. And the problem for Lily, they're a pharmaceutical company. Among other products, they've invented um, Prosaic, I know, and some, some other products we're, we're familiar with. In any case, uh, so they live and die by innovation. Without innovation, uh, a pharmaceutical company like this is, is not going to is not gonna survive, as we heard about in the, in the beginning. Their problem was, or their dilemma was, that they're isolated in Indianapolis. I've seen it, I mean, Indianapolis at that point was a community whose identity was really built around infrastructure, transportation. The motto was the crossroads of America. I mean, you have a sense it's some place out there in the Midwest, it's kind of south of, of Chicago by five hours. It's cold in the winter. But the real point was, it was it's, at that point, it was a, a community whose, you could call it now, we call it its ecosystem, really revolved around transportation, kind of a hub for transportation. There were some other activities as well. Lilly was an organization that was all about pharmaceuticals. Well, you could say that's great. It's the only kid in town that kind of had this monopoly. But its problem was, was its, its dilemma was, it needed to fuel um, its innovation, it needed earlier stage 
uh, ideas, products that would come from the biotech industry. And there was no biotech industry in Indianapolis. So the decision makers, the leadership at Lilly was contemplated, should they move to Research Triangle in North Carolina? And you've heard about that region between, um, you know, between um, um, uh, where Duke University is and University of North Carolina, North Carolina State, there's kind of a triangle in that region. And that's a high tech uh, region, a lot of biotech, a lot of scientists, a lot of engineers in a, in a, a growing life science industry. And there's a lot of other pharmaceutical companies or other pharmaceutical companies. So the leadership of, of, of Lilly was, uh, uh, it needed to leverage the ecosystem that was there in North Carolina and that the isolation in Indiana, in Indianapolis, was really a, a liability, was, was pulling it down. So yeah, sure, what do they need in that uh, ecosystem? Now, this is the one particular company, one particular industry, one particular moment of time. You know, part of my conclusion will be, you know, like everything else, there's no one ecosystem. There's a different ecosystem for um, software, there's a different ecosystem for filmmaking, for uh, I guess we're going to take an, an excursion on the weekend so I can uh, study the wine industry an hour away from here. I guess that's a different ecosystem. You know, I've done this before. The trouble is I never remember by the time I get home. Um, uh, but in any case, for pharmaceuticals or for Lilly at that point, they needed, they, needed, they needed scientists, they needed people doing research at universities, they needed talent to go be, work in the company, uh, they needed the support of, the, of the, the government, the state government, the city government, um, and the, more than anything, they needed smaller companies with biotech uh, products. Because one thing we've learned, those companies typically don't grow into pharmaceutical companies. They sell their products at a certain point. So you get this kind of complementary. Lilly's problem was it, was it was isolated. Well, what I've observed in my, and I, I haven't really participated at all in this, um, um, uh, but, but more just observed it, was that uh, uh, the, the company got together with the, government, with the city government, the state government, and with the university, uh, Indiana University is up in Indianapolis as well as Bloomington. That's where the medical school is, the School of Public Health. Um, and they made this a strategy, a priority. They shifted the identity of the, or you could say the, um, the strategy, or the, but it involved this change in identity in the city away from a city where it was going to be based on transportation and infrastructure. It also had done pretty well with amateur sports, but instead made it a goal or a strategy to focus on creating a life science industry. And so in a way, we had all three sectors working together. Among other things, the universe, there was also a foundation actually funded by the Lilly, uh, uh, the Lilly Foundation but it's arm's length, more than arm's length. It's independent with the mandate, do what's good for the place, uh, help the place, the place being Indianapolis, the state of Indiana. And somehow there was this consensus that what would help the place was to try to, maybe not hang on to Lilly, but to try to leverage these uh, capabilities in pharmaceuticals. And so um, there was a big priority in attracting talent both to the university, attracting scientists, and trying to generate a life science industry, a biotech industry, helping people. There was funding for startups, funding for entrepreneurs. Now, what's interesting, you would, I would have thought, oh, that focus on entrepreneurship, that's not about entrepreneurship. But actually, that's exactly what Lilly needed to stay competitive. It needed the entrepreneurship because it can't do everything itself. Um, you know, has it worked like most things? Um, it's certainly not the same city I got there uh, in 20 years. Now it's a hub, a life science hub. It's changed a lot. The identity of the city has changed a lot. Uh, uh, the way people think about themselves, the way they think about what drives that community, it's more high tech, it's more knowledge, it's more uh, innovative. And I think that the way the rest of the world sees the city has also changed from being, it used to be called, so my students' parents tell me, Indiana no place or something like that. And uh, I, uh, nobody calls it that anymore, I guess. Um, so yeah, what does that say? There's a lot of different strategies for ecosystems. Uh, depending on 
you know, I'm, I'm an academic, as you heard, so my answer is always, well, it depends. And it depends on the, it depends on the place, it depends on the industry, it depends on the different people at the industry. And I, I think that's, I think that's um, you know, reflects a complicated world. There is no formula that's going to deliver a successful ecosystem for any one place. I'm impressed by the, um, the Indianapolis story, really, because it seems to have taken that community further than it used to be. It seems to have helped the company. It seems to have helped the university. Of course, like any choice, by going in that direction, it doesn't go, you know, what was the road not taken, not traveled? I don't know. I know some places that don't do anything. We have a city in Indiana, Gary, Indiana, that at one point, when I was a boy, was one of the richest cities, communities in the country. It was um, a, a steel town just south of Chicago. And it was right up there. Detroit at that point was the richest city in the, in the world. Hard to believe to you young people. Um, uh, Pittsburgh was right behind it. Gary was up there in steel. And they didn't change. They didn't do anything. They were really like deer frozen in the headlights. I'm not, that clearly is not a good strategy or solution. I couldn't go up to Indianapolis and say, was this the optimal solution? But it seems to have done pretty well, that's for sure. So anyway, um, what do ecosystems need? Um, well, they, and that's the complexity. I think, I think ultimately each place is different. And ultimately ecosystems are about, they're about places first and, and foremost. I mean, they need resources and factors. What's interesting about my example of, uh, of Indianapolis is it shifted from being based on factories and plants and infrastructures, highways, I mean, we still have highways, uh, to a different uh, a resource and factor, um, uh, uh, which is typically what we think about for an idea-based or an innovation-based, you could say uh, society, community, but also organization, sure. It needs talent, it needs human capital. Some people call it uh, the creative class. Uh, it needs people with ideas. All that's about a, a certain kind of resource or factor, almost like an ingredient you put in if you're making a cake. You know, it's sugar, it's flour. Um, but then other people say, oh no, it makes a difference. What do you do with this ingredient? And that's where the, uh, that's kind of where the ecosystem comes in. Do you put all this, all your ingredients, all of your activity in one industry or sector. Uh, that's certainly what they did in Gary, Indiana with steel. That's what we would kind of had done in Indianapolis with, um, with the, the, the transportation hub. Um, or do you, uh, 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 do you have specialization? One of the uh, uh, most successful communities in the United States, nobody ever hears about it uh, outside of the country, even in the country, is in Huntsville, Alabama. Who would think that? But there's, a, uh, uh, there's a, a, a cluster of aerospace companies. All of the aerospace companies are there. The university is there. They work together. They've got a great um, uh, community of scientists, engineers, one of the most educated in, in the United States. And they've generated a very strong standard of living for that community. Uh, but it's specialized. I was invited down there a couple of years ago because they were really worried somehow knowing with the fate of Detroit, which had been specialized in autos, or the fate of Gary which, or Pittsburgh that had been specialized in steel, they thought maybe we need to diversify out of aerospace. Actually, rather than have these monopoly comp uh, company, large uh, dominant companies in the aerospace industry, maybe instead what they need is, is entrepreneurship. So they were trying to change their ecosystem. I mean, I couldn't say was that the right thing or the wrong thing. Just like Detroit, um, my grandfather was the uh, editor-in-chief of the, the newspaper, the Detroit Free Press, and after he retired in 1964, he wrote his, his sole book called Coming of Age in Detroit about the emergence of the great city. I mean, it was a great city. The strategy of specializing in one thing worked great um, around the factor, not of human capital and knowledge and innovation, but around the factor of, of of factories and machines, physical capital, that worked great until it didn't. So no, I mean, I don't think, I, I could certainly go to Huntsville and say, no, this isn't gonna work anymore. But I was impressed by uh, just what we really heard. Think about the future. Just because it's worked in the past doesn't mean it will work in the future. Uh, 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 
so there's an actual example of uh, specialization in German regions. It's a little hard to see, I think. Uh, but you can see uh, some of the, uh, 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 like Volks, Wolfsburg um, in Germany uh, specialized in auto production. Maybe it's not the best example these days to use uh, with Volkswagen there. But we've got other, uh, other cities. Rüsselsheim, uh, outside of Frankfurt, also has this specialization in, um, in automobiles. Or near Heidelberg is where SAP is, was founded, um, which is an interesting example of, of that um, link between entrepreneurship and, and entrepreneurship. Uh, SAP came out of, really out of IBM. There were four employees, or five employees rather, uh, engineers working at IBM. And yes, it's an idea company. That used to be the motto of IBM, uh, the idea company, or think rather. So these employees thought they came up with a new idea, a kind of a, a software, a business software. They went to their boss, their boss's boss, and said, look, here's an opportunity for IBM. Uh, they didn't probably use the word entrepreneurship, but we need some entrepreneurship. But this is, again, the trouble with ideas. The boss, the boss's boss looked at it and said, you know, looks nice, but we don't think it really looks that nice. Um, we don't think it's really, you know, how do you separate the good idea from the bad idea? In the end, these young people were so impressed with and so passionate, just like the commissioner and her talk about what they were doing. They wanted to pursue it, so they thought, okay, they'll become entrepreneurs. They went to the uh, three main banks of Germany, the Deutsche Bank, the Dresdner Bank, Commerzbank. The banks liked it, but they said, if we're any good, IBM would be doing it, so that didn't work. In the end, they got some startup funding from a, a, a small regional bank near Heidelberg, started SAP, and the rest is history. Now you've got a region there that's specialized. I think what's interesting, not just these bigger regions, but a lot of the very smaller regions in, in Germany are specialized around um, a Mittelstand, a small, medium-sized company, maybe 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 employees, making a specialized product that dominates in the world. Sometimes these are called hidden champions. So you can see that strategy of specialization works, but it works in the context of an ecosystem. There is a, a Fachhochschule, a technical college that's generating labor, really specialized with a focus for that company. The employees um, are of a, a very long-term relationship with the company. Uh, it's an ecosystem that works very well. So specialization um, is uh, a different kind of dimension. There's a, another component of ecosystems that, that matters. There's a wonderful book written by a, a colleague, a professor at the University of North Carolina, Al Link, and he wrote a about, book about actually the same research triangle I was talking about, which is a community, a, a region, uh, involving several different cities, small cities in North Carolina. And um, uh, uh, it, it, the book's called A Generosity of Spirit. Now, I'm an economist, he's an economist. I thought the book would be full of data about, uh, uh, about how the, uh, uh, what, what happened to the region and so on. But the first page is a photo of the governor of the state. And uh, uh, the next page has a photo of uh, some of the civic leaders in the state, some of the business leaders, and perhaps the president of the University of North Carolina way back in 1959 or something like that. And uh, Al starts the book by saying, well, North Carolina was the poorest state in the United States way back in the 1950s. It's, he didn't, doesn't say ecosystem. People didn't use words when he wrote this book 15 years ago. But he said, the, the, the economy consisted of, of, uh, of crops, just small scale farm crops, textiles and shoes. The labor was unskilled, hardly graduated from college, or from high school rather, and uh, tobacco, which had no future, in any case was unskilled labor. So that the youth of North Carolina did what the youth does in places like there, places like in Australia too, it fled it fled for opportunities someplace else, mostly on the coast, uh, what they call the brain drain. Well, here's where the generosity, I love the title of this book, the generosity of spirit was the leadership. It was the governor, but other leaders of the state who felt that they wanted to give a future to the next generation and realized they couldn't do it with a state that everybody thought they're a bunch of hicks. 
I'm not going to translate that word for you. Um, and they, they realized nobody wants to be there. Nobody wants to come there. Uh, people want to leave. They changed the identity and the image of the state. Uh, they didn't do it overnight, uh, but they uh, got the, they realized, well, it was going to be, it was a university-based strategy. They got Duke University, University of North Carolina, the state, the, the land grant, the Agricultural University of North Carolina State together. And this was kind of the core of their, now we'd say their ecosystem strategy. But it wasn't just to become high tech. That's the way most of us would see it today. It all started by changing the way that people in that place thought about themselves and other people uh, thought about them as well. It's interesting, back when, um, as, uh, uh, as Indiana was kind of going through this transformation, becoming a, a life science, biotech, uh, driven ecosystem, the governor of the state called a little meeting up in Indianapolis, and I went up there with a couple other people, and he said, well, maybe what we need is a triangle like they have in North Carolina. You know, we've got Purdue University out there, and we've got the Indiana University in Bloomington and the medical school in Indianapolis. We could have a triangle. And so, you know, the, the so-called experts are kind of going back and forth, and after a while, the governor uh, got impatient, as they tend to do, and he said, he goes, I can see this is going nowhere. He goes, down there in North Carolina, they're high tech, they're scientific, engineered, entrepreneurial. He said, we in Indiana, we have different tradition. And the guy next to me, I didn't know who he was, he whispered in my ears and he said, heck, he goes, I'm from North Carolina. When I grew up, we were a bunch of hicks. And, you know, it doesn't really say exactly what, uh, uh, if that would work in a different place. But I see that optimistic because it's clearly an example of a place that got a strategy, changed, uh, and it changed by working together, not as maybe those classic examples of, of, of uh, entrepreneurship that I learned about way back in, in graduate school, although it was using a typewriter. Uh, 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 I don't know if the world's changed or we've just become aware that, uh, as the theme of this conference, that it's much more of a community activity um, and in that sense, Harry Clinton's probably got it right. I don't, I don't know about raising children, but in any case, innovative. It's probably not done in isolation, but, uh, but involves a community. Thank you very much.